The first ship delivering aid to Gaza since the start of the war arrived last Friday. It didn't come from the U.S. or the U.N. It came from a celebrity chef, Jose Andreas. The situation is as bad as you see on the news. What I'm always telling everybody, I cannot stop the war, but we can try to do as much as we can to make sure that everybody has access to water and everybody has access to food. My co-host Martin Powers got the chance to speak with Andreas recently, and they talked about this nonprofit he founded, World Central Kitchen. It feeds people in desperate situations, after earthquakes and hurricanes and in war zones. Andreas went to Gaza late last year, and he said it's one of the most dire situations he has personally ever witnessed. Hopefully, sooner rather than later, we'll have this ceasefire that everybody is looking for. Peace will be achieved and no one more person will suffer the consequences of, of this confrontation. Andreas has been cooking since he was a teenager. He came to the U.S. from Spain, and he went on to open restaurants in New York and D.C. He's also developed a pretty high profile outside of the kitchen. During the Trump years, he was outspoken about the rights of immigrants. And more and more, he's been feeding people in war zones. And that's been tricky at times. Lately, he's gotten criticism both for his actions to help Israelis in the wake of the October 7th Hamas attack, and for his work in Gaza helping Palestinians. I've done World Central Kitchen, and I've been myself in Gaza. We've done almost 34 million meals already. And still I had pro-Palestinian or whatever uh, striking in front of my restaurant because they find out that World Central Kitchen was feeding in Israel. Of sure, we were feeding in, in Israel because the people were decimated. Entire communities were under attack. Many people die. Many people suffer. And World Central Kitchen was going to be there next to the people. When something happens in America, we don't look if they are a red state or blue state, if they are Republicans or, or, or Democrats. We don't look if they are Jewish or Muslim or Christian. We only see people and we go to help people. And if anybody has a problem with that, they're going to have a, a problem with me because the most human thing we can do is making sure that we provide food and water to people. And we will always stand for this. We will always do this. From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Elahe Izadi. It's Thursday, March 21st. Today on the show, a conversation about food and conflict and the ways they intersect. Martin talks with Jose Andreas first about one of his restaurants, Zaitinia. It's been a staple in D.C. for 20 years. And this week, Andreas released a new cookbook based around the dishes from the restaurant. These recipes are also at this intersection of conflict and history between the Mediterranean countries where Andreas found his inspiration, Greece, Turkey, and Lebanon. Here's Martine. I went on a trip a couple weeks ago to Greece and Turkey, got to eat so much amazing food there. I was just eating my face off the whole time. But I found it really interesting that, you know, in Turkey, I'd be served something and say, oh, this is kind of similar to a Greek food that I've had that's like this. And they'd be like, no, 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 no. It's, it's not similar at all, actually. Like, this is very, very different the way that we do it. And, you know, you'd go to Greece and I'd say, oh, I just had something like this that was in Turkey. And they're like, ah, no, you haven't had this. The Turkish thing is completely different. And I think that's part of a healthy sense of competition, you know, like a friendly competition between different countries. But I also think that it is a reflection of some real tensions there, right? That like these are countries that in the past have been at war with each other, which have these unresolved tensions that have, you know, a feeling of wanting to see their ownership of a food recognized and kind of their version elevated. And I guess I wonder how you navigated that as you were thinking about the restaurant and also thinking about this cookbook of like what it means to put out a version of a recipe or a meal that is more Turkish or more Greek or more Lebanese when there are so many arguments about whose dish this actually is and where it came from. Yeah, do you imagine that we could resolve all the tensions and wars going on in the world 
by just doing <laughs> friendly culinary competitions about who makes the best version of sometimes the same dish. Uh, we can go to Satsiki in Greece or Sasik in, in, in Turkey. And, and obviously, it's even unfair about talking the big picture of the recipe as a whole country, because even when you go to every country, in every region, will be their own versions of garlic or no garlic, of more oil or no more oil, of uh, I'm putting lemon or no, I'm putting mint and dill, or I'm putting mm -hmm. another herb like uh, parsley. And it's fascinating. And then doesn't even go to the region, goes to the families. You go family table to family table, and it's not two versions equal. This is the fascinating thing about food and cooking, you know, that Everybody can be defending their own right to call what they do the best or the original. And it's very difficult to argue because if you think it's the best, well, good for you. Uh, I support <laughs> your belief that you are making the best. What I've always tried to do in every one of my restaurants is really gather the information of, of what the master's recipe is, that at the end we come up with what we feel is the best version that fits what we like, what we think is best. Sometimes because the technicalities of doing a big volume in a restaurant uh, or because, hey, we want to do it this way because we like it like this way. You know, many tzatzikis, some have more cucumber, some has less cucumber. Many recipes traditionally, they will even marinate the cucumber for quite some time in the yogurt. And the cucumber, because the city of the yogurt will kind of get softer. Me, I love to mix the tzatziki in the last moment. Why? Because I like uh, the cucumbers to be crunchy. Therefore, mm. we try to mix the cucumber. I will not say per order, but we are making it constantly. Every, every 10, 20 minutes is, is brand new tzatziki. That's the way I like to eat it. Will some people from Turkey or Greece and say, hey... This is not the way my grandmother used to make it. <laughs> uh, you're right. And I'm sure your grandmother's was great, but I believe our version is awesome, is good. Mm -hmm. So at the end, the amazing thing is that if something really unites people in fascinating ways, mm, this, is, this is food. And with food, very often, is the moment that even if everybody is going to be very protective of this is Greek or this is Turkey or this is uh, Lebanese, well, uh, it's great that they have this pride, but also it's a lot of dishes that, yes, they came from one place once upon a time, but today belong to many. It's, I could argue that we are a falafel nation. We could argue we are a hummus nation. It's different people that they are even sworn, sworn enemies, or they, they have historical differences. And at the end, I will always say, well, that's fine, but everybody eats hummus, and everybody loves hummus. And I do believe, I wish, maybe I'm naive that, you know, if we could be bringing more people, you're sharing the food they love to the table, they will see that they are much more similar than, mm. than different. And that's, that's what food does. Uh, gives perspective of who we are, where we came from, where the history of the world is. And it's a lot of people that do share the love for the same, not only ingredients, but for the same dishes. And that's a a good point of unity. Hmm. I love that. I think a lot of people are also familiar with your restaurants because they, in some ways, have been part of your activism. And I'm thinking specifically during the years when President Trump was president, um, you were very vocal about your opposition to his attitudes towards immigrants. When he was still a candidate, you actually pulled out of a deal to open a restaurant um, in what was then the Trump International Hotel in D.C. Once he became president, you held the Day Without Immigrants, um, which was this attempt to protest his administration's stance on immigration and kind of make the point of this is what immigration brings to this country is this amazing food that you wouldn't be able to experience um, without the people who are vital to um, being able to make it. So as we are in this moment thinking about what it would look like to have another Trump presidency, what do you think about like 
the future, if he were to be president, like what would that future look like for you in terms of would you want to kind of go back to that activism? Are there lessons that you learned from those experiences of kind of publicly opposing Trump that would inform how you respond going forward? Yeah, I don't think I ever oppose anybody. I only stand for what were my beliefs. Obviously, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. when you are standing for something that is very opposite to what other stands for, well, yeah, there is the little confrontation. But I, uh, through the years in my restaurants, I've seen obviously Democrats and Republicans, presidents and senators and congressmen. Very often in my restaurants, I hosted both uh, parties. I don't call myself an activist. It's only I'm trying to be logical with the way I was welcome into this country for what this country stands for. And I'm only trying always to find the middle ground. So my main issue was, I do believe we can have different points of opinion without degrading the other side or degrading the other person. I felt like uh, immigrants were really being used for political purposes. When we did the day that my restaurants were closed because it was uh, the immigrant uh, day that you mentioned, it was not even my idea. It was my, my team members that they came to me and they said, hey, don't get upset, but we're not going to come to work. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's fine. Thank you for letting us know. So me, I said, well, what if we, we join you? We support you. Uh, it was not my decision. It was their decision. And everybody thought it was the right idea. And, and I'm glad we did it. Uh, so, yeah, you can call it activism, but I will more call it just living with your values and standing mm. for for your values. And I think I'm an immigrant. I was given a huge opportunity coming to this country. I'm a very proud, uh, everybody knows I'm a very proud Spaniard, but uh, everybody knows I'm a very proud American too. And I do believe as an immigrant, I live this double life. I believe people like me and many more immigrants, not only in America, but in every country around the world, we become bridges uh, that sometimes we, we try to bring common sense because we understand we belong to more than one place. And our role should be always trying to bring people together. I want to come back to um, this idea around your commitment to trying to feed people in tough situations. And I think this, um, in some ways, much more than your restaurant at this point, is what you have become kind of famous for. So you have a nonprofit food aid organization called the World Central Kitchen. And I've heard it described as essentially doctors without borders, but for chefs, that you are providing food for people around the world in really tough situations. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and how you select the places that you're going and and how you kind of triage the acute food problems that you meet in those moments? And I was a very young boy, 23. I began volunteering uh, in low-income neighborhoods around Washington, D.C. And I saw there the power of food, even in a more profound way, to really heal, to really give a chance, give opportunity, give dignity, fighting hunger, creating opportunity all at the same time. That idea of the power of food, obviously, uh, was strong in me and is what, uh, in the distance, I kept seeing places like Katrina, that we had tens of thousands of Americans for days without food or water. And nobody seemed to be doing anything about it. And my brain began like, oh my God, well, how, how is this possible? It's so easy to feed people, even in an emergency. We always have the people, we always have the food, and it's always a kitchen somewhere. It's not so difficult. Obviously, I went from the moment of saying something in my brain to the moment of action, Haiti happened. I was in Cayman Islands, very close. I don't know, it was the, the horrors of the tens of thousands of people under the rubble after 2010 earthquake in Port-au-Prince. And I got on a plane, I went to Haiti. And I don't think I went to help as much as I went with the intention to learn And I began cooking next to a Spanish NGO that had a big presence for many years in Haiti. They welcomed me. I found a place where I could use 
have kitchens, buy food, pay people used to join you, which was great. But in a moment, they didn't have any jobs. And start cooking and start making a few thousand meals a day. And that's how mm. the idea of World Central Kitchen. Can we show up in an emergency and activating the local power to feed people in need? That's how World Central Kitchen began. I'm curious how you said that actually feeding people in difficult situations is actually pretty easy, um, which I found kind of surprising, right? Because I think that um, in so many of these circumstances, it does feel acutely hard to try to get food to the right people as quickly as possible. I'm curious, like, what are some of the ways that you guys have managed to do this more efficiently and more quickly and in higher volume than so many other places have before? Well, uh, I mentioned Katrina before and the Superdome, right? Think for a second what an arena is. Think for a second what uh, a stadium is. Uh, if you ask, everybody's going to say, ah, it's where I go to see music. Dolly Parton, all right. It's where I go to see my <laughs> the Capitals and the Wizards. Okay. I could argue, I could tell them they're wrong. And a stadium and arena, you may think it's a music place or a sports place, but I could argue to you that it's a gigantic restaurant that entertains with music and sports. It's restaurants in every one of those places. The last hurricane that arrived to New Orleans, World Central Kitchen was there. I was able to arrive there one day before uh, the hurricane. Actually, I was coming from Haiti because it was an earthquake. And guess what? The kitchen we opened was literally 400 meters from the Superdome. Do you know how far away is the main food warehouses that provide food to the restaurants and hotels and supermarkets of New Orleans from the Superdome? 0.8 miles. Mm. You only had to grab 20 strong people even if you had water up to your, your belly, you will find somebody in those food warehouses. You will grab some hot dog bands and some hot dog sausages. You will bring them to the Superdome. You will hit some of those flat tops. And in less than one hour, you will be feeding everybody hot dogs. This is sometimes who simple it is. Well, many organizations, no, no humanitarian, but businesses, families, anybody, any, any group of people. Usually we are taught always since we were very young to follow a plan. We all have plans for what? For everything. Plan for this, plan for that. But you cannot plan for everything. Okay, now imagine we embrace the complexity of the moment and you embrace adaptation. Everyone, every circumstance is different. It's not two hurricanes alike. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what people so admire and respect about World Central Kitchen, this, this sense that you guys are cutting through red tape, that you're kind of making decisions on the fly, adapting to the circumstances and getting people food much more quickly and, and just not waiting around, right, for plan A to work, like coming up with plan B in the moment when you need to do that fast. Um, but I, I've also heard criticism of that approach as well, including reporting from Bloomberg recently that there have been workers and volunteers who felt that they've been thrown into dangerous situations or not necessarily uh, prepared to deal with what they're going to be experiencing on the ground or that um, they felt like the, the kind of plans made on the fly they weren't comfortable with. I, I'm curious what your response would be to that criticism that that also has drawbacks and that you end up putting people who maybe aren't prepared to be in dangerous, volatile situations, especially when it comes to war zones. Correct. I, I think their concerns, uh, whatever was uh, the people that made uh, those comments to that particular investigative uh, journalist, they had the right to have uh, that feeling and, uh, and those concerns. But obviously, when you are joining a humanitarian organization that goes into hurricanes, where you have electric poles all over the place and bridges that may be in danger and roads that they are sometimes covered in water, the truth is that the way to be safe is you staying home and doing nothing. So in this place, I 100% agree with you. 
But uh, World Central Kitchen has never made anybody go anywhere. In Ukraine, nobody went in Ukraine that didn't want to go. We lost six people in Ukraine, volunteers. Why? Because we were cooking all over. We had 500 uh, kitchens. We were in many fairly close to the front lines. Why? Because we had to feed the elderly. We are in Gaza right now. Nobody is in Gaza that doesn't want on their own to go. So my point is, does World Central Kitchen put anybody in danger? I will say no. Does working in humanitarian organizations that do relief have dangers? Totally yes. Does World Central Kitchen look after its people? I think totally. After the break, Jose Andreas and Martin talk more about World Central Kitchen and the work he's done recently in Gaza. We'll be right back. The logistics of feeding a lot of people is always complicated. But when those people are in a crisis, the challenges can seem insurmountable. So Martine asked Jose Andres how he goes about this, including what to cook. Well, uh, you know, very often uh, we always cook local and we cook with whatever foods we have around us. Uh, in the early weeks, before our numbers were, were bigger, people were very surprised because you will see that we had these trays of rice and you will see a big piece of whole fish that was grilled. And people were like, are you cooking this in Gaza? Yeah, mm -hmm. we were cooking this in Gaza. Why? Because there was a fish farm that even in the middle of the confrontation, uh, they still were running, even they, they had electricity and they had to keep the fish kind of alive. But we were able to be buying from them, grilling the fish and giving thousands of fish every day to the different families that we were serving. Obviously, the people we have there are Palestinians. Mainly in the kitchens are divided between the women that are amazing making bread. We have some women doing the cooking in some of the kitchens, but sometimes the, the hot cooking is done by the men and the, the breads are done by the women. And what do we do? We do dishes that they are traditional, like freke and these uh, rice and lentils uh, with the spices mm. that they love. Why we cook local dishes? Because when, when what we have are local chefs, I'm not going to be telling them, hey, make me mac and cheese or make me jambalaya. No, they are going to be always cooking the dishes that they know. And that's what World Central Kitchen is known for. A lot of people praise us for doing the local cooking in the places we go. And I always laugh. It's like, well, actually, this is the easiest. When we go somewhere, usually the dishes we cook are what the local cooks know how to cook and is what people love uh, to mm -hmm. eat. So and it gives them the most comfort in very totally. difficult situations. To arrive with those dishes that for them is home, in this moment of disrepair, in this moment of mayhem, is what sometimes gives people hope that maybe tomorrow things will be better. That's why sometimes when you can, cooking things that people know and recognize is an amazing way to give them respect, to give them dignity. Hmm. Wow. This seems in some ways like a moment when you're seeing more people use food as a form of protest, and not just in their choices of what they eat, but also in their choices of what they don't eat. So, you know, we were talking about Ukraine, we were talking about, about Gaza. Um, after the war in Ukraine started, we saw a lot of reports of people who were boycotting Russian restaurants in the U.S. And I think a lot of those people know that these are often owned by Russian Americans who, you know, don't necessarily support um, President Putin in Russia, but still that there is a sense of like Russian food at this moment is not a culinary tradition that we want to celebrate. And I think similarly at this moment, you're seeing a lot of people who say, you know, I don't want to go to an Israeli restaurant right now, or I don't want to go to a Palestinian restaurant right now, either because I don't necessarily feel welcome or safe, or because, you know, this is my way of saying, 
I don't agree with what's happening or this isn't the food that I feel like I want to celebrate in this moment. So I'm curious for you, because you talk so much about like what it means to break bread with people who have differences with you and bringing people together through food. What do you think about the idea of people who are saying maybe not eating foods from certain places or cultures and moments that are very tense is a way to show what I believe? Yeah, this is, uh, this is complicated. Uh, myself, in a way, I'm a little bit guilty on that. I changed the name of a very traditional tapa in Haleo, which is Ensaladilla Rusa, Russian salad, which is a, mm. the beloved potato salad. And I changed it to Ukrainian salad. Mm-hmm. Obviously there I was not uh, touching anybody or, any, or anyone. It was more a statement of we were with Ukraine. Support for Ukraine. Mm-hmm. I've, I meet um, in different countries uh, many Russians that they are totally so upset of what Putin has done to Ukraine. I've been invited to homes in Ukraine of older people that they only spoke Russian very much, that they were asking me, the guy coming from outside, why? We are brothers. Why is Putin doing this to us? We are brothers. We are the same people. When you go then deeper, we saw Israeli restaurants in, in, in Philadelphia that people were boycotting outside and striking outside and when they are good owners and good people, that they have absolutely, you can be upset maybe at Netanyahu, but, but you can be also upset at the leadership of Hamas that allow that crazy attack to Israel. But then we can keep going back in history because everybody keeps bringing history. And yes, history is history, but we cannot do nothing with what happened 10 or 50 or 70 or 300 years ago. But we can do something about what today. What's happening right now in Gaza, leaving so many people hungry, it's not the right thing to do. It's immoral. I cannot do anything of a war, but yes, we can all have the same voice saying nobody should be hungry, nobody should be without water, and obviously nobody should be dying, civilians, women, children, uh, under bombs, only because we have few leaders that they feel they have the power to do whatever they want with humanity. Jose Andres, um, thank you so much for this conversation. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Jose Andres is a chef and restaurateur. His new cookbook, Zaytinia, is based on dishes from his popular D.C. restaurant. It's out this week. He spoke to my co-host, Martine Powers. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. Today's show was produced by Emma Talkoff. It was edited by Maggie Penman and mixed by Sean Carter. Before we go, I wanted to tell you about a new show from the Washington Post Opinion section, the side of the Post that focuses on ideas and perspectives. The podcast is called Impromptu. It's basically like listening in to our really smart colleagues on the opinion side as they talk through the news that they cannot stop thinking about. The first episode dropped Wednesday. It focuses on an abortion pill access case coming before the Supreme Court next week. Here's a clip of Amanda Ripley and Ruth Marcus talking about why this case matters. So we know, for example, that the number of legal abortions in the United States has stayed steady or actually slightly increased since Dobbs. And it's probably, right, because it got easier to get abortions in many progressive states, partly because it got easier to access the abortion pill, right? Right? Is that right? Yes, this goes precisely back to where we started. Um, Kind of the mailbox is the new back alley. In the olden, terrible olden days, when people were dying from botched illegal abortions, they had no choice but to go to physicians or God knows who else was performing abortions. Now you can find ways to obtain abortion medication, even in states where you're not supposed to be able to do it. To hear more, look for Impromptu wherever you get your podcasts. We'll also put a link in our show notes. 
I'm Elahe Izadi. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post. <laughs>